Welcome to Commander Central, episode 150. And today we're going to take a look at Patreon supporter Charles Godot's Akiri Line Slinger and Bruce Tarl Boros Partner deck. I'm Dana. And I'm Max. Max, it's back to just you and I for this week. It is. Chris was getting a pedicure, so he uh, couldn't record. Yep. That does sound relaxing, though. I will grant him that. They are. Yeah. My wife watches these weird pedicure videos before she falls asleep. That's, okay, I get it. So I, I, it doesn't do anything for me. But I'm like, of all the things to watch that's going to make you fall asleep, well, that's what she watches. Well, and she probably watches them on like Facebook. Yes, and then it's yeah, just or a, something. It's yeah. just a trap because then it just plays another one. Yeah, and another and you one. Keep watching it. And yeah. all of a sudden, two hours goes by, and everything yeah. you want to do on a Saturday afternoon can't get done. <laughs> <laughs> that is me with like cake decorating videos. I'll just start watching one because it's like mesmerizing, and then all of a sudden, it's like. Oh, I was supposed to go somewhere 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I do get sucked into some of the food ones sometimes and occasionally like this guy made a throwing axe out of an old yes. lawnmower blade or like those kind of weird things he sometimes gets sucked into too. The dude who uh, blacksmiths his own like weapon <laughs> yeah. replicas yeah. of Marvel weapons. Yeah. Yeah. I get sucked into those as well. So uh, I shouldn't, shouldn't criticize because I've absolutely been there. Yes. Uh, so anyway, Chris is off doing that. So it's just Max and I who are going to be doing a deck tech here tonight. How are you doing this week, Max? Anything exciting going on in your life? Not really. I got I played a game. We talked about that on Monday, I yep. think. Um, otherwise, just getting some stuff ready for the show. You know, working on those t-shirt designs. Those will be hopefully ready by the time this airs. Okay. If not, they will be ready shortly after this episode. All right. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you're getting ready for Commander Fest Chicago. I am. That'll be coming up here pretty quick. And then we have GP Max's house coming up. Kind two of weeks after that. Two weeks after that. we got a couple people coming to town to hang out with. We'll be playing some, a lot of games a that weekend. A lot of games. And probably try to get something recorded, I think, for sure, yes. that weekend. Um, and then at that point in time, we're looking at the holidays, and we'll and, have ugh. schedules probably for next year that will be out. I hope they release them around Christmas week. So like we can start doing some Christmas. planning. Yeah, I'd be okay with that. And then at that point, we need to start getting video prepped so we can make the first of the year. Yep. Um, and at that point, Theros isn't far off. So it's uh, it's coming. Uh, more sets. More sets. <laughs> but. We get a gap. And the Theros one will be interesting. We're going to do some fun stuff for that. Yes. So we'll, it's going to we'll, be real fun. We can't say what we're doing for that. It's a, it's a secret. But we've got some stuff going on, so that'll be fun. Yeah. So a Boros deck we're going to look at here today. Um, so number one, you know it's bad. It actually isn't as far as Boros goes. Say, it's, pretty, it's, it's actually pretty tightly tuned as far as the Boros deck goes, but it has all the inherent problems in a Boros deck. If you want to reach out to us and have us do a deck tech for you on a Thursday show, how would you do that, Max? Head over to patreon.com slash cmdrcentral and check out our reward tiers. Uh, I believe the decks you play start uh, at the $20 level, so if you are so inclined and can support us financially, we'd greatly appreciate Absolutely. that. You get some cool swag. You get entered into some awesome contests. And, I mean, you're buying me pants, so <laughs> hey. It's a win-win. We actually, uh, Charles actually got his playmat in today, and he posted a picture of it and said he can't wait for the deck tech, and I'm like, we're recording it here in yeah. like two hours, so. I forgot to mention this to Chris. Someone in the last batch of playmats I sent got the loser playmat. The, oh, they did? Yep. So we signed these in, in batches, essentially, yeah, yeah. you know, because it's easier than just, oh, we have one today and right. one tomorrow. And on one of them, under my signature, Chris wrote, loser. <laughs> Someone got that play mat. Nice. I'm not going to tell you who. I hope uh, they realize it. All right. The special collector's edition. Yep. L loser Max play mat. Okay. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell us here, Max, what Charles told us about this deck? Uh, yeah. So uh, his meta he currently plays in is uh, pretty competitive between the two stores he plays at locally. They have tournaments on Thursdays and Sundays. Uh, he has a, a one-year-old, so it's really tough to make it any days besides those, which we understand. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, when my son was first born, um, I, I I was just kind of starting to get into magic at that point in time. And I remember for the first couple of years um, looking on a calendar, like, months out, like, okay, the pre-release for this set is scheduled on you know, March 17th. So I would like have to put it on the calendar and schedule with my wife. Be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this pre-release that day. Is there something coming up? Do we have to, can we plan for that? Like I wanted to make sure I like yep. wasn't just taking off to play. And I probably didn't start playing Commander even until he was a couple years old. Yeah. I wasn't comfortable going all night Tuesday. Um, and even then the first year or so I played, I didn't start playing until like 
five thirty or six at night because I used to go home after work just to like see him and make sure do the family thing, do the family thing. Everything was cool. And of course, now he's old enough, and he got to be old <laughs> enough pretty quickly where he like didn't. Okay, Dad. It didn't feel as important to do that, but like, yeah, yeah that's no, absolutely. Like having a one year old completely changes how often you can play. Exactly. For sure. He says both stories are no joke. They are both bringing more people with intention to win, so it's kind of a cutthroat experience. And stepping on necks with no lack of remorse. <laughs> uh, both stores are always multiplayer pods, so the uh, matches are always three to four people per pod and can't kill anyone before uh, turn six or eight, depending on what shop you're at. Okay. Interesting house rules. Yeah. Um, the goal of the Boros build was to prove people that it's not a bad combo to have and have fun swinging with big things. He has plenty of games where he's had to wait for the kill until turn six or eight because it comes out so fast and aggressive. This is his pet deck 100%, and he's kind of a spike at heart. When he sits down and shows commanders, people always go, oh, it's just Boros, and then 10 minutes later they're getting salty because he just killed somebody with Infect or just <laughs> beat down, and that feels pretty good, and I agree, I get that. It's fun yeah. to win games with decks people <laughs> underestimate. Um, he wants the deck to be feared. He wants to sit down and flip it and have people be afraid of seeing Boros come down because they know how good it is. So the weaknesses of the deck are pretty apparent. He has little ability to stop a combo player from going off other than beating their face in before they can combo. He also has a trouble with token-type decks, having only one main swinger. It's difficult to have defense when they go wide. And another player is another problem is when Akira gets taken out a few times, it's pretty difficult to win without being lucky and drawing a Relia or something because it's so expensive to cast her, particularly in Boros. The last, of course, is card draw, which is always a problem. Um, but he usually tries to kill people before that's an issue, so that hopefully is kind of a workaround. The main goal is to be feared. He says he wants to repeat that. So he's going to leave it up to us guys to either tune it as max as you can in Boros or switch to Jeskai. Um, I don't think we're going to do that. I like Ooh. it being Boros. <laughs> we have some Jeskai fans, in particular one of them, the Jeskai, who won't like hearing that. But, no, I think... Uh, Challenge that's, accepted. That's maybe the easy way out. I sh in, in a way, I think... I like that it's Boros, and I want to keep that identity. So um, let's jump into this here, Max. Why don't you read the two commanders off to us? Sure. So we have Akiri Line Swinger, uh, a red and a white for an O3 legendary creature, core soldier ally. It has first strike and vigilance. And then Akiri gets plus one, plus O for each artifact you control, and it has partner. Okay. Uh, Bruce Taro Borish Herder is two red and a white for a legendary creature, human ally, which is a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever Bruce Taro or enters the battlefield or attacks, target creature you can tr you control gains double strike and lifelink until end of turn, and also says partner. Okay. So Boros partners, instead of using uh, partners like people usually do to get an extra color in, it's just going all in strong to Boros. I'm kind of down with that. So, first things first, what's the curve here, Max? We are looking at an average CMC of 2.92 with most of the cards landing in that 2 and the 1 to 3 drop spots. 2 has, I think, 17 cards in it, but 1 and 3 are pretty dead, dead even with cards. So, that's pretty lean for this kind of deck. Very lean, especially for Boros. I mean, yeah. you typically rely on those more expensive mana rocks. Yeah. Um, land base first, like we usually do. What do you say? Sure. 35 lands. That's a new magic number. <laughs> that's the, I was just talking about dropping down to 35. So that seems pretty fair. However, there's not a ton of basics here. I'm um, only 16. There's eight snow covered mountains and eight snow covered plains. And when I say not a ton, I say that as <laughs> that's, someone. That's 16 basics, Dana. That's, that's a lot more <laughs> than I usually run. Um, so I, I get that. There's also a good amount of, there's a few off color fetches here too, which makes it equal, equal, easier to uh, kind of get those perfect. Perfect mana base going on. Is there anything you'd really change here in this in this mana base, Max? Um, so there's 35 lands, all the fetches that he can run. I don't. I think it's fine. I think if I don't think that his games go long enough for something like Command Beacon. I would tend to agree. But, I don't know. If there's enough mountains. I think Valkut is really tricky to run a two color deck. I don't know if I'd want to try to do it here on an aggro deck. I don't think you want to have that land that always comes into play tapped either. So I, I think that makes sense. I don't know if I do change very much here at all. Obviously, the you know perfect plateau would be fine to run if you had one. It's 
I don't. It's and, not worth picking one up. I don't think it doesn't make your deck that much better. And he did note. I don't know if you we covered this. Uh, he does have some of those duels. They're sure. just in a different deck. Yeah, I, I, it's not worth. Like honestly, it wouldn't be the kind of thing I think would be worth changing it out before the game. It's obviously if you have an ABUR duel, they're great. But particularly in a two color deck, the difference it makes is just I think fairly minimal. So if I had one, I would add it. But I, I think this is roughly the mana base I would run in this deck. Um, one card I'll quickly mention, because I always kind of want to run it in deck and never really get around to it, is um, Sunhome Fortress of the Legion. It's a colorless land, and it's looked past for colorless, or you can spend two red-white. Target creature gains double strike until end of turn. So we already have Bruce that grants double strike. It seems maybe a little redundant, but I guess there's not a lot of downside to it, too, since you do have the ability to tap it for colorless and it doesn't come into play tapped. Four mana, though, in this deck, that could be putting more artifacts on the battlefield to swing sure. with a Kiri. That could be mana that you could put into a Rogue's Passage to get through for the lethal kill. Right. And I'm sure there are some equipment in this deck that grant double strike. Is what I'm guessing. In in addition to the Bruce Tarl obviously yes. doing it, I'm I'm just wondering if you if if haste wouldn't be better there, would you be better off if you had the if you you know ran that Hanwer Garrison here or that Flamekin Village or that Hall of the Bandit Lord? Yeah, that or even like Slayer's Stronghold. Sure, because uh, that grants haste and plus two plus zero. Oh, is that what it is? It gives vigilance haste and plus two plus zero oh for just a red and a white and tapping. So it's two less mana. And in my opinion, you're getting way more benefit. Just the plus two plus O makes a sure. carry a two three with no artifacts out. I don't know if I would necessarily pull out um, the, the the Sun Home land, I, I guess. But I would be very tempted to add in a couple of the haste lands. Yeah. Maybe in those again, we're talking about me who doesn't run enough basics. <laughs> you could cut down one of each basic, probably. And then just put... You wouldn't get... You have so many colorless cards in this deck. I don't think you'll get burned running unless you're seeing Blood Moon regularly or Back to Basics. I don't think you're going to get hurt running a couple more utility lands, particularly those ones. Like, that haste is going to... If you have to cast a carry again on turn eight or nine, but you have 14 artifacts in play or something, like, right. giving her haste and just killing somebody is worth it. Totally. So I, I would try to find a slot for a few ha haste ones. There also isn't any land removal lands in here, I don't believe. Nope. Um, you know, I think it's just a speed thing. Could be. Maybe it's not for an issue. Right. I mean, turn six does come quick. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so so maybe you don't need them. I, I have a – man, there's almost always a strip mine target, but, like, maybe there isn't in this deck. Maybe you just don't ever have to deal with it. So that could be. Very well. So we'll do the artifacts, I think, later on, because there's a ton of them. And let's just do the sorceries right now, because it's pretty quick. There's only five of them, and I'll read them off. We've got Brass's Bounty, Divine Reckoning, Open the Armory, Steel Shaper's Gift, and Wrath of God. So two of those are tutors. Open the Armory is one and a white. Search your library for an equipment card, reveal it, and put it into your hand for one white mana. And Open the Armory is a white and a colorless. Search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So in this deck, there is a couple auras, um, literally a couple auras. So mostly I'm guessing that's going to be going for various equipments. Um, Divine Reckoning and Wrath of God are both board wipes. Both cost four mana. The difference is Divine Reckoning leaves one creature up, probably a Kiri in this case, I would guess, most of the time, and it has flashback. Brass's Bounty is kind of a neat card I've never seen anyone cast. Six and red. For each land you control, create a colorless treasure artifact token with sack this creature and add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So that's basically going to create more tokens to make a Kiri that much bigger. Yeah. What do you think of this configuration here, Max? I think I think it's fine. I think I think the deck overall is a little wrath light because okay. you are in Boros. You know, that's kind of its strong suits. You you know, I, it shocks me there's no Blasphemous Act in this deck. So Blasphemous Act, we say it a lot, is a one-mana board wipe. It should be. There are absolutely times when someone's got a 15-15 out and Wrath of God would have solved that problem. Yeah. And it doesn't. There's also a lot of times when a one-mana 
Blastmas Ractal lets you immediately rebuild your board state in a way that Wrath of God doesn't. And I would guess that happens way more often than the Blastmas Act not killing enough creatures thing happens, particularly in a combo meta. Yeah. So myself, I absolutely would replace Wrath of God with Blastmas Act. Okay. The other one I will mention here is um, Chandra's Ignition. And I like what Divine mm. Re- I like Divine Reckoning. I like how it keeps probably a Kiri up. Chandra's Ignition does too. It's going to keep your <laughs> creature that you're targeting up because it's one that deals with damage. Yep. And it's very often going to kill people. If a Kiri is a, you know, 14-14 or a 16-16 or something um, from all your tokens out, there are times, plenty of them, when that's enough to win the game. Or at the very least, get people close enough so a Kiri can kill one person and then you drop something that has haste with the haste lands we suggested and someone else is low enough, they kill somebody else. I think in this kind of deck where your commander is routinely ginormous, it's worth doing damage off Chandra's Ignition in exchange for losing the flashback on Divine Reckoning. Yeah, especially if you cast it after combat and Akiri still has a lifelink from Bruce oh, God, yeah, yeah. You're just getting oh, all better. that life. Um, my only downside, and I don't think it's that big of a downside, but I'm going to point it out, he he is running two of the swords that gives pro red. Okay, so he probably so, so he can't choose his. There's a very s- sure. small chance to where it's like, hey, I can't cast Chandra's ignition on a Kiri. Sure, that makes sense. Um, that, however, also is one more reason to run Blasphemous Act. Yes, because then your your commander is even more likely to survive. Yeah, I agree. So, I think definitely Blasphemous Act. Good point about Chandra's ignition. I would still be very oh, tempted oh, to run. I it. would still run it. I mean, it's two cards of the ninety-eight. Yeah, right. Um, I like Brass's Bounty a lot. I think seven mana is a ton. I still like it. Yeah, it's, you don't see it played, so I'm I like that it's being played. And the bonus synergy in this deck with Akiri is pretty solid too. Yeah. There's one tribal spell here which we'll mention, um, and because it's just sorted that way, which is Eldrazi Conscription for eight mana, and it's an enchantment aura, and we mentioned that it's one that you could technically go fetch with Open the Armory. Creature gets plus ten, plus ten, and Annihilator two. So it's kind of just a win condition if you cast it on Akiri. For yeah. the most part, I mean, if someone can't block her, it's probably commander damage. If she has any amount of, like, by the time you can cast this at eight mana, you have enough artifacts out that she's probably a 10 or a 12 or something. If Bruce goes for double strike, but, like, you're killing somebody. Yeah. Um, and eight's a lot. Eight is a ton. And there's no real way to cheat that, and you're done, this isn't a ramp deck. Oof. I like the card, but I don't know if I run it. I I have a better aura, I think. What's that? Uh, it's from Throne of Eldraine, and that's all that glitters. Oh, oh yeah. It's one in a white enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one for each artifact and or enchantment you control. All your treasures, all your equipment, all Man. your mana rocks. That alone is a Kiri. So very often you're exchanging, you're, you're paying six less mana, and you're losing the Annihilator 2 trigger. But you're probably still getting plus 10, plus 10. But you're probably getting plus 10, plus 10, if not more sometimes. Right. Huh. Um, that's really tempting. Yeah, no, I like that. That's a good call. Because there's no way to cheat that on, really. So, yeah, no, no I, I, that, that would be a good replacement there. I like that. Okay, good suggestion. Well, so that's an enchantment, and you just mentioned an enchantment. Why don't you tell well, us what enchantments we have here? Hey, we have seven other enchantments besides the Eldrazi conscription. Uh, technically, oh, no, that's still an enchantment. Sweet. So we have Authority of the Consoles, Blind Obedience, Dark Steel Mutation, Irola Scott Victory, Land Tax, Sigarda's Aid, and Smothering Tithe. What do you think, Dana? Trash cards each and all. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey, wrong slogan. <laughs> um, I think I run those in decks of mine for sure. Um, I don't think I run Authority of the Consoles, but I get why you run it. Um, I don't know. So here's the thing about why did... Eh. I, I'm I'm probably in the minority here. I get why people run Authority of the Consoles, and, and I might as well read it. It's one white mana. Creatures your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, you gain one life. And Blind Obedience is the same thing, similarly anyway. Um, artifacts and creatures enter the battlefield tapped that your opponent's control, and it has Extort, which you can still act, with, activate yep. in this deck. Those are never wrong choices in white decks, and I guess they do shut off combo. That's maybe why he's running them. There's some combos that 
if their creatures yeah. are coming into play tapped, it completely turns off. I mean, he did mention one of the shops is more creature focused aggro so decks, so it's make slowing a down your entire yeah. meta. Yeah, I always feel like this is me. This is entirely a playstyle thing. I don't run any propaganda kind of effects anymore because I feel like I just want to be going at people versus hoping they don't hit me. I don't think it's wrong to play defensively at all. I'm just saying for playstyle purposes, I wouldn't run those because it's not what I want to be doing in a game. But that doesn't mean it's a wrong choice. I'm just saying personally, I want to be going at you, not hoping you can't come at me. Mm -hmm. This is a deck that wants to be going at you, and I feel like running things that go at people is a little more synergistic. However, it does remove blockers, and that's maybe aids your offense too by making them come into play tapped. So um, I don't think those are wrong choices. Just wanted to mention that. Dark Sun Mutation obviously is a great card. Uh, Aroas gives yourself gives you some unblockable, and if it happens to turn into a creature, then that's even better as a 7-4 Indestructible. Yeah. Land Tax is Land Tax. Fathering Tide is great as well. Sigarda's Aid gives you one more way to mess around with equipment since you can equip it at instant speed, and it's only a single mana. Yeah, I mean, it gives your equipment flash, and then they ETB and auto-equip. Yep, which is also really, really, really yeah. useful. Uh, okay, so you had one suggestion here. You mentioned the All It Glitters. I and have another one, too. What's that? Uh, just had, uh, Pia's Revolution. So this is an enchantment for two and a red out of one of the, I think, Aether Revolt. Okay. Um, whenever a non-token artifact is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, return that card to your hand unless target opponent has Pia's Revolution, deal three damage to them. Okay. So it's a way to get your your recursion with all these. You have all the swords of X and Ys. You have your mana rocks. Like, you're not going to get your treasures back, but, you know, one Vandal Blast in this deck might be done. Yeah. So if this is a way to recoup from that or anything, it, it seems like a it might be a little slow for the metas, but it might also be very valuable when the game goes past turn eight or nine. Sure. Um, one <laughs> suggestion I had here was gratuitous violence. Um, <laughs> if a creature you control will deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. You have multiple things in this deck that grant double strike already. What's nice about gratuitous violence, number one, you're in red and white, so it's relatively easy to hit the triple red pips, much easier than it is in a three or four color deck anyway. But the fact that it stacks with double strike, so it essentially is double, double strike. Yep. You don't have that problem where you're like, well, I don't, it doesn't do me any good to cast true conviction in this deck maybe where Bruce is going to give your commander double strike and you have Sun Home giving double strike. I would run gratuitous violence here. I think it's the difference between killing somebody and not killing somebody. It's just one more doubling effect, and it's a doubling effect that doesn't interfere with double strike. It stacks with it. So I would be very, very um, interested in finding a slot for that in this deck, I think, for sure. Okay. Um, the other one I was thinking, and he mentioned, we, we talked about how there isn't much draw, and he said it really isn't a problem for the most part. Outpost Siege is Red's Phyrexian Arena, and I'd be, I don't know if I would build a Boros deck without it, but it is four mana and doesn't do anything until the next turn. And if this deck is that aggro, Yeah, I think that is exactly it. why it's not in this deck. Yep. I think it was at one point, and... It wasn't fast it enough. It wasn't fast enough. Whereas Gratuitous Violence, you drop it and immediately you're doubling damage. Yeah, you're winning. It's another Gisela. So that's a card I would for sure have in this deck. And again, it stacks with Gisela. Yeah. Like, Gratuitous Violence stacks with everything. Yeah, it's so good. So yeah. I would put that in this deck for sure in, in, in an enchantment slot as, as, as well. Uh, okay. Instance? Instance. Let's do it. What do we got here, man? We have 11 instants. So we have Aurelius Fury, Boros Charm, Deflecting Palm, Dispatch, Enlightened Tutor, Generous Gift, Mana Vault. Well, that's in a weird spot. Um... <laughs> Path to Exile, and Response Resurgence, Return to Dust, and Swords to Plowshares. So technically 10 instants, because 10 instance. for whatever reason, Mana Vault is being classified as an instant in this deck. That's very weird. Uh, Aurelius Fury is a card you don't see much, so let's read it here. It is White Red X, Instant Speed. Aurelius Fury deals X damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or players. Tap each creature dealt damage this way. And a player's dealt damage this way can't cast non-creature spells this turn. 
The Anti-rift last... card. Yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, assuming you cast it before they cast Rift, it would have to be resolved before they even attempt to cast. So I, I feel like that portion probably doesn't make a huge difference. Yeah. Unless you're going to cast it during your upkeep and say, okay, either counter this or you can't cast counter spells this turn and let me do what I want to do. But I don't know. Is that worth three mana? I don't the know if it is. The fact that it's X divided among... I wish it was just a everything gets dealt X damage. Sure. But it would probably lose that secondary clause of tapping stuff down. And and, and I wonder if the tapping things down isn't the important part to help Akiri get through. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that very well could be. And if that's why it's being used, I think there are better ways to do that. Yeah. That doesn't... Because, I mean, casting this for three mana, meaning you put one into X, isn't... You're going to get rid of their commander from blocking you? Sure. Yeah. I feel like this is a a really high floor, low floor, high ceiling. I tend to agree as well. I always screw that up. I feel like gratuitous, again, talk about gratuitous violence. Gratuitous violence is, uh, is always going to be impactful. I don't know if this is always going to be impactful. Yeah, I, I would rather slot in more like protective instance into this slot. Sure. You know, Teferi's Protection, you know, that's a pricey card, but it, it does work. It saves you. Or even what, what's the new indestructible granting one with addendum? Is it uh, addendum? Unbreakable formation. So for those of those, you who don't remember it, because this was in Ravnica Legion, so it has been, mm -hmm. what, eight months? Mm -hmm. Jeez. Uh, two and a white creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn, but it has addendum. So if you cast this during your main phase, put a plus one, plus one counter on each of those creatures, and they gain vigilance until end of turn. So uh, which... Can be useful. Can be useful. Um, the fact that it's instant speeded away to save your creatures, I think, is pretty useful there. Yeah. Um, I do like Boros Charm here a lot. Oh, I, If you're playing Boros and not playing Boros Charm, it better be because you don't have a copy of the card. <laughs> you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> uh, Deflecting Palm. That's another one that I've seen do amazing things. And I've also seen it, even like when I played Boros, I would draw it and like I have nothing to do with it. Yep. And like, in, is it really worth deflecting five damage back? Correct. Like, and in most combo decks aren't dealing damage to you in one huge burst, so I don't even know if it's going to prevent some kind of a combo. It's not saying some don't. Maybe there's you know various aether flux reservoir kind of combo things going on that are going to dome yeah. you. But I feel like <laughs> more often than not, they're, it's, it's doing some kind of incremental damage or making infinite tokens or doing whatever. And I don't know if this is going to stop that. And if you're playing an aggro deck, what's this going to stop too? That's that's stopping things early in the game when you're aggroing at people. I don't know if it's it's a, it's a neat card. Like you said, I've seen it do good things. I don't know if I want to draw it in this deck very often. I wish it was more, and maybe I'm wrong, because it reads the next time a source of your choice is, yep. deals damage to you. So, like, I'm thinking, like, maybe there's, like, a Cranko deck in the meta where, it, you know, Goblin Shark Shooter, shooter combo... Sure, I guess. But it's only going to prevent the first instance of right. that damage. It's not going to stop in the impact tremors that someone's doing infinite things yeah. with or... I mean, Teferi's Protection does this way better. Yeah. Again, it's a pricey card. I get that. Yes. But, you know, phasing yourself out might just be better. Yeah. I, I agree completely. Uh, Dispatch. We just talked about we this on Monday. Uh, on Monday's show. And this is a perfect deck for it because it's pretty much, like at any point in the game when you want to cast it in this deck, you probably have Metalcraft. And if you don't have Metalcraft, do you care? You're going to lose anyway. Like in this deck, right. if you don't have three artifacts out at that point in the game where you want to remove something, you're so far behind it probably doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, worst case, you're tapping that thing down so Akiri can get in for the first six points of damage. Right. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Or... You're still exiling something. That's a, yeah. No, that, that even if you're just tapping something in this deck, maybe that's useful enough. So that's a good call. Um, I like the card here as well. Enlightened Tutor go, goes to get an artifact or an enchantment. It's just one more tutor to go get one more piece. I'm surprised we, this is a little bit because they always go together in my mind. There's no idyllic tutor in this deck. Does idyllic only get enchantments? Is that um, why? Idyllic only gets, no, it'll get in any enchantment. So it won't just get ores, it'll get anything. But it, but it doesn't get artifacts. But it doesn't get artifacts. Yep. Okay. So that's why that's not in this deck. Yeah. So never mind. I'm. I'm. Thank you, listeners. I know I'm not smart. <laughs> um, enlightened, I think, does it, make sense yeah, here. It goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it also will go with that gratuitous violence if you already have double strike from something else. From something else, particularly Bruce, probably. Yeah. Um, generous gift. Great card. We talked about, talked about Monday. It's a great removal spell. 
Um, Mana Vault, we will reclassify as an artifact, because yes. it is an artifact. Um, Path to Exile, again, along with Swords of Plowshares, two cards we discussed earlier in the week. Return to Dust, just a good removal spell, but I'll come back to it. And Response Resurgence. So, I have it up. All right. Uh, so, resp- this is uh, one of those split cards from guilds, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Response is uh, Hybrid Boros, Hybrid Boros for an instant. Response deals five damage to target attacking or blocking creature. And then Resurgence is three red-white for a sorcery. Creatures you control gain first strike and vigilance until end of turn. After this main phase, there is an additional combat phase followed by an, an additional main phase. I'm going to bet all my chicken's eggs that that's what this card gets casted for. Yes, indeed. So, a couple things here. Return to Dust we'll start with. Okay. Those who don't remember, two white, white. Exile target artifact or enchantment from the game, and if you played this spell during your main phase, you may remove up to one additional target artifact or enchantment from the game. So you exile two things during your main phase, one thing during someone else's turn, or in, uh, during an instant speed portion of the game. It's an exile. I like Return to Dust. Four mana is a lot. Wear and tear hits two things as well. It hits them at instant speed always. And if you don't have all the mana free, you can still hit something. I have seen plenty of times someone's been at two mana and they've only cast half of wear and tear, but they've hit the thing they had to hit that turn immediately as an emergency versus having to leave four mana up. How often do you think in this deck they're leaving four mana up for just an instant speed to solve an instant speed problem? I just don't know if that's something you can afford to do. I think it's somewhat a meta call. Maybe you need the exile. Yeah. But I think if you really, if you think about it, and like, and this is this is to Charles, think about it closely. If you think that exile doesn't make a huge difference, and there are some metas where it doesn't, I think wear and tear is just a better better call here. What are your thoughts here, Max? I like wear and tear. Ugh. Now, how about this? I like return to dust so much, though. So how about chaos warp then in that slot? Because not only with an artifact or enchantment, it'll do it at instant speed always, and you can hit a land, you can hit a planeswalker, you can hit a creature. I would prefer chaos warp over wear and tear. Okay. I, I think we mentioned this in the other show. I think you run chaos warp in any deck that can run chaos warp. Yeah. So I would have that here for sure. I think wear and tear might be better than like Aurelia's Fury. Yeah. Because it's just removal. Sure. Although it's not creature removal. So like. Yeah. It depending on what you need and when you need it. Like all cards you put in your EDH. Decks. Absolutely. How about the response resurgence? You're you're casting it for the extra combat step. So, if you're almost always casting for the extra combat step, seize the day costs one less. And it has flashback? And you can flash it back and do it again. Now it only hits one creature. But, but you don't how, care in this how deck. often in this deck are you attacking with multiple creatures? And being able to do it twice. Sometimes in the same turn, it's four and then it's three. So yeah. it's seven mana for two attack steps versus five for one. Um, it's worth it. I think it's worth it. I would make that move. I would change from from Resurgence, Prons Resurgence, to Over to Seize the Day, I think. The, the, the ability to use it twice is worth it. Yeah. While we're talking the uh, extra combat steps, now this is just a, a card that I want to see someone run. Okay. And this is the deck for it because I feel it's all about Akiri. Chance for Glory. Which one is that? It's from Guilds of Ravnica. It's one red and a white for an instant. Creatures you control gain indestructible. Take an extra turn after this one. At the beginning of that turn's end step, you lose the game. So you're just basically... It's, you're going to the wall. Sure. I don't know if it's... It's not good enough for this deck. I don't think it is either, but it's also one of those cards that will be fun to run. It, 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 it ranks right up there with Breast's Bounty in my sure. book. Like, that's sure. the instant I would run it, you know. Okay, there's no Planeswalkers in this deck at all. Ooh. Um, I think they're all too slow. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, the, the Mono White Nahiri is too slow. Um, yeah. The, the Boros Nahiri is amazing, but at four mana to destroy a tapped artifact, enchantment, or creature. Yeah, I, I don't think. know if it's what you want. And the, the Rummaging isn't that great. Yeah. I think this is a fine being a no Planeswalker yeah. deck. So that leaves us with a pile of artifacts. And creatures. Oh, yeah. There's a couple creatures. Let's do the creatures first. So 16 creatures. Um, we'll probably go through these pretty quick. I yeah. do have, I think, one recommendation. Okay. 
Uh, so we have Aurelia, the war leader. That's OG Aurelia. Uh, six mana, extra combat stuff. Yep. Danisha Capuchin, that's just a three mana, bunch of keywords. But she does help with the, uh, the uh, equipment yep, of equip things. Equip costs go down. Dockside Extortionist, the MVP from Commander this yeah. year, uh, makes more treasures. Uh, Gisela, Blade of Gold Knight, the new Gisela. The old Gisela, double damage, half damage towards you. Yep. Goblin Welder, go get something. Right? It's a nice recursion package in this deck, too, so I like it. Yep. Goto, Bandit Warlord. Uh, that's interesting in this deck, but I get it. Yeah, gives you an additional combat step. It doesn't untap everything, which can be tricky, but you do a few ways to grant vigilance. So. And it is a tutor. And it is a tutor. Go to piece of equipment. Six mana tutor. Yep. Uh, Heavenly Blade Master. This is the new angel from Commander last year. Yeah. Uh, six mana. It has flying double strike. It's a three six. And when it enters the battlefield, you may attach any number of auras and equipment you control to it. And then other creatures you control get plus one plus one for each aura or equipment attached to Heavenly Blade Master. Six mana is a lot, but I think it's worth it. It's a backup plan. Yep. Uh, Kazul's Toll Collector. Um, just a free equip to it. Yeah. Uh, Palladium Mirror, Pure Steel Paladin, Selfless Squire, uh, Sarah Ascendant, Shram, Senior Edificer, uh, Stone Hearer Giant, uh, Sun Titan, and Tajik Legion's Edge, the new one. All right. So what suggestions did you have here? Well, it's stupid expensive now, but a uh, Stone Stone Forge Forge Mystic would be great in this deck. Sure. And then there is, I don't remember the name, so you're going to have to help me with this. You run it in Vela, and it's from a conspiracy set, and it takes everybody else's equipment. Armory Automaton. That one. It is three mana for an artifact creature construct. It's a 2-2. Whenever Armory Automaton enters the battlefield or attacks, you may attach any number of target equipment to it. It is a great backup plan for Akiri. If you ever see other equipment decks, it's a great way to just screw them over by taking all their equipment. Now, you don't get any of the benefits from that equipment. If you take a sword of the Animist, they get the land. Right. You know, but just de-equipping someone's stuff oftentimes is enough. And the fact that it oftentimes throws lightning greaves on there and it gives it haste in addition to, you know, you can throw your equipment on there as well. I think it's a worthwhile backup plan as well in addition to Heavenly Blade Master. Oh, for sure. And it's an artifact itself. Yeah, so you can go find it with a couple of your tutors. And it just pumps a Kiri. Yeah, right. It also pumps both. So there's like no downside to it. The other backup plan I would put in this deck is a new card from... Uh, Throne? Throne of Eldraine, sorry. Took me a second there. I forgot what I was doing. Um, a podcast, apparently. Fervent Champion um, is a one-drop human knight with first strike and haste. Haste mm-hmm. is really useful. When it attacks, another target attacking knight you control gets plus one, plus all two on the turn. Um, but the important thing here is equip abilities you activate that target for a champion cost three less to activate. So that means basically the vast majority of the equipment in this deck equips for free. And when you're looking at things in a deck that are already there, like Kazul Tolls Collector, where you are just attaching equipment to it, this is going to be able to do that as well. And... I, I think I like it better. Yeah. Because it reduces, the, the, like I said, it's going to attach most things you, uh, I don't know if I would replace Kazul Toll Collector maybe, but like, I think I would run them both. It's just one more beater option to your commander. One more backup plan. I think having backup plans in a deck that's this focused on having the commander as your win condition is a good idea. Yeah. So um, that, that would be the, one of the other creatures I would add here as well. And, and I actually have one more. Okay. And that would be Scrap Trawler. Just another recursion package yep. when it or another artifact is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, return to your hand target artifact card in your graveyard with lesser CMC. So this lets you, if someone destroys multiple pieces of equipment, it lets you bring it out. I mean, like. Yeah, you can stack it. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good one as well. But otherwise, I, I like this creature package. You need a backup to your commanders. Yeah. And I think all of these creatures are scary. Like, this is what I would build in this type of deck. Yes, they either interact with equipment or they, you know, just do their good beaters on their own. Like in the case of Tajik, they help out. You have the uh, mentor ability. Yeah. I mean, a, so, ba- a Balan could go in this deck, yeah. you know, if you wanted, but four mana, that might be, who knows? Aurelia gets out here, so. Aurelia's a pretty nice backup plan here as well. Yeah. Okay. 
equipment, or I should say artifacts and equipment. Yes. Why don't you read the first couple to us here, Max, and we'll see what we got. So we have Blackblade Reforged, uh, Bloodforged Battle Axe, uh, Boro Signet, Colossus Hammer, Dark Steel Plate, Fire Shrieker, Four Bears Blade, Grafted Exoskeleton, Hammer of Nizan, Helm of the Host, and we'll pause there. Okay. After that, we're looking at Mana Geode, Mask of Memory, Mind Stone, Soul Ring, Swift Foot Boots, Multiple Swords, Sword of Body and Mind, Light and Shadow, Sinew and Steel, Truth and Justice, and War and Peace, plus Sword of the Animist. Then we have a Talisman of Conviction and Trailblazer's Boots. Some evasion. Tw- tw- oh, plus the, the Mana the Vault, vault. We, missed, we missed earlier because it's categorized as an instant. So 24 artifacts which are a pretty good amount to start buffing Akiri up in addition to the buffing they do themselves. Yeah. So what do you think of all these? Um, so I, I'm i not a big fan of Helm of the Host. Yes, we've said it on this show, you know, slapping that on, you're not putting that on Akiri, maybe put it on Bruce Taro, but nine mana to make a copy of something. The only things in this deck I want to make copies of are Aurelia, Gisela, or Sun Titan. Yeah. I mean, Akiri gives you one more big beater swinging in, I guess. But, but I, you don't get command damage off the, tar- right, the copy. Correct, That's correct. why I wouldn't put it on Akiri. And it doesn't give really any combat buffs. It just makes the, the copy. And if this is an aggro deck, that's pretty slow unless you're cheating it onto something with one of your... Which yes. there's a few things that do that, but I don't know if there's enough. I mean, this would be why I would run Stoneforge. Drop sure. Stoneforge, go get this. Next turn, drop it into play off of that. Yep. All you got to worry about now is the five mana to equip. Yes. Um... Bloodforge Battle Axe. Love it. I don't know if I do. Really? Because you have to equip them all. It does. Now, the one thing the one thing that does maybe like it a little bit more is it's whenever a equip creature deals combat damage to a player, so you can make two of them mm-hmm. with double um, strike or... with, with your Bruce Taro. But okay, so I so next turn I have two more Bloodforge Battle Axes, and I'll equip them for four mana, which isn't insignificant if you don't have Pure Steel out or something. Right. So now there's three on there, and I guess you're going to make three more into six, I guess. In a, in a perfect situation, you can make a gazillion with double strike, but you have to keep equipping them, and you have to keep dealing. Like, I think there's a lot of, I think it's a cool card, and I guess it does buff Akiri. I don't know. I'm kind of maybe, I, I like it, but I, I can see how there's situations where it isn't that impressive, too. For a one-mana artifact equipment, I think it's great. Okay. It's two to equip. Like, it's an early threat, you know, play this on turn sure. one, play a carry on turn two, equip this on turn three. Swing and make swing, another one. Oh, that's a, okay. Swing and nope. make another one. That's a good point. The It's really on curve with the commander. That yeah. I get that. That makes sense. I don't think you're going to get anything better for a lower cost. Okay. Uh, Boral Signet at two mana. Yeah. I mean, all the mana rocks in here. I'm actually surprised there aren't more mana rocks. I am, too. I think this is a deck that has a lot... That, is using a lot of slots up, but there's a lot of room to breathe for other things. And being in two very fast metas, you know, yeah. is a Thran Dynamo on turn four right. what you want to be doing on right. turn four. I mean, Arcane Signet, like, okay. Yes, Arcane, Arcane Signet Signet's, should go in this deck. Yeah, and, and it's better than Boral Signet just because it doesn't require you. It just makes you the mana. Yeah. For the most part, you don't got to put anything into it. I, I would make, I... I don't know what I would pull, but... I would either, I would swap the Geode for it. Yeah, the Geode isn't that amazing. ETBs to scry one and then one of any color. I will pay one less mana to lose the scry. Yep, I would agree with that. That's where I would. That's the cut I would make. A uh, Colossal Hammer. I mean, got Colossal Hammer. Excuse me, one mana to cast. 10-10 and, and, and loses flying, but like it doesn't have flying anyway. Right. Um, equip eight. But you do have a few things that cheat the equipment in here. A lot of things that cheat the equipment. And you know what? If this deck is as fast as it is, that might not be a problem. Yeah, if you can get if you can get it on there, you kill somebody probably. Yeah, with a Kiri, yeah. Dark steel plate. I also don't like dark steel plate. I don't either, but I think this is really meta dependent. If you don't have sure. a lot of exile or single target removal in your metas, yeah, you're fine. This is this is gravy. If people are casting a lot of board wipes. This gets you. Yeah, I think if I were to replace this with something, I would put endless atlas here. Just to draw a few cards? Just to let you draw more cards, because okay. that's going to be the issue with this deck, is you're, you're going to run out of stuff to draw sure. play, especially making treasures with, you know, the Dockside Extortionist, Smothering Ties, Brass's Bounty. Using all that mana and not being able to refuel your hand is going to be an issue in this deck. Yeah. I Even if that. it's a fast meta, like, on turn four, you don't want to be Hellbent. That's true, yeah. Uh, Fire Shrieker. 
I like it. It's another double strike enabler. It, you know, five mana total to cast and equip. I don't see any issue with it. Um, you have the land that grants double strike. You do have Bruce Tarl, which I think you're hoping to use a lot. I think it's fine. What I would put in the slot is Inquisitor's Flail, <laughs> which is also two mana, two mana to equip. If a equipped creature would deal combat damage, it deals double that damage instead. Again, it's a thing that stacks with double strike. It stacks with Crudus Violence. It stacks with all kinds of doubling effects. If another creature would deal combat damage to the equipped creature, it deals double the damage instead. So, I mean, it's it also makes it more fragile. But you have multiple ways in this deck to get your commander through unblocked, whether it's Rogue's Passage or um, Aroas. There's a few things in here yep. that enable that. Um, not that double strike isn't good, but I think but you don't want to go too deep into effects that become redundant. And I think the damage doublers like Gratuitous Violence and Inquisitor's Flail are never dead. No. Because the way they stack. So uh, that would be the, probably the card I would run in that slot. Yeah. Um, I think we mentioned this one on a previous show in the not-too-distant past. Mm -hmm. uh, Tenzel's Go to Maul would be great in this deck. Yeah, because it's just plus three, plus three, and, and trample, trample on to your either, commander. either of your commanders. And it's cheap. Yeah. It's really efficient. And I, that's probably the one I would replace the next one with, which is Forebearer's Blade. Quip Creature gets plus three, plus uh -huh. so Vigilance and Trample. Although I like Forebearer's Blade plenty myself. Whenever a quip creature dies, attach Forebearer's Blade to target creature you control. But I don't think that's how, like, I think you're still, for the most part, wanting to attack with a Kiri or with something else. I don't know how often a Kiri dies and you're like, well, I guess I'm going to move this over to Bruce. And I think when a Kiri comes back out next turn, you want to start attaching things to her, not Bruce. I just, I feel like I don't know if that ability is going to be that useful so, in the stack. So it gives plus three, plus O. Oh, Vigilance and Trample. Vigilance and Trample. Is that better than Conqueror's Foil, which gives you plus one plus one for each color among permanents you control? So in this deck, plus two plus two, but then staples that uh, Grand Abolisher effect onto it. So during no. your turn, well, that's that's one I'm going to suggest. That was what I was going to suggest in the slot. <clears throat> I would run both Flails in this deck, Inquisitor and Conquerors. Yeah. If you're playing in a combo deck, a combo meta, which means you're probably playing with a lot of people that are running instant speed spells and counter spells and such, shut them off. Yeah. And do it in an equipment that also buffs your commander. Yeah. And also gives a plus two, plus two. Yeah. So it buffs it based on being an artifact. It buffs it plus, you know, so this this makes it basically, it reads your commander gets plus three, plus three, and people can't counter your stuff. Yeah, you have a turn to not worry about anything. I think that's better. Yeah, I think that's a hundred times better. Yeah. It is kind of pricey, though, because it's only been printed once. How much is it? $10, $15? Just shy of, it's eight fifty. Ugh. But it's only been printed in the, in, I think it was printed in this deck, actually. It might have It might have been. So that's one I think that I think it's worth running for sure. Yeah. Um, got the Exoskeleton obviously is in, just going to... In fact, wins games. Yep. Games got to end. And, 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 you know, one of the things I mentioned before was um, Shiner's Ignition. <laughs> that's that wins one all more the games. way to kill everybody with Graphic the Exoskeleton. Hammer of Nizan <laughs> is one thing I do... You know, if I had to choose between that and Dark Steel Plate, I would choose Hammer of Nizan. Number one, when it comes into play, it equips for free. And it gives a creature plus two plus zero. Oh. Yeah. Um, it itself isn't indestructible, but like, I just there are so many scarier things to deal with than one piece of equipment. I can't believe anyone's trying to, for the most part, remove your indestructible equipment. Um, Des desperation. Yeah, I, I just feel like th that's not much of a loss, and the fact that it buffs your creature and can equip for free is a lot of upside here. So I like that. Definitely more than Dark Steel Plate. Yeah. Uh, Helm of the Host, you mentioned that you don't think you loved, and I no. kind of agree. Um, same thing with Mana Geo. I don't think the Scry is worth it for a three mana rock at all. Um, run a two mana rock, or maybe even run a better three mana rock. If you're going to run a better three mana rock, just run Chromatic Lantern to make sure you're always on your color. So you don't ever care. Yeah. Um, especially because there are, like we said, there's a lot of colorless producing lands in this deck. Mm hmm. So I mean, it's it's a security blanket. I'll admit yeah. it. It's it's my security blanket. And I'll run a commander's fear. So like when you you're when it's turn eight and you're like, yeah, I'll just sacrifice yeah. a draw card. Or masterwork of ingenuity, which is to just cheaply copy whatever you want to copy. Yeah. Hey, I'll t I'll make another sort of body and mind. Yeah. <laughs> Early on, I'll copy someone else's soul ring. Right. Late or or is it only your own stuff? Actually, uh, I forget. Let me. I think, look. I think it's only your own. You may have it. Enter the battlefield as a copy of any equipment on the battlefield. Just equipment, okay. It is only is. equipment, but, I mean, who cares? You make 
a copy of your own thing. Another yeah. hammer and a zon. Is that legendary? It is not. It is. Dang. I tried. Um, another blood forge battle axe. Yeah. Or, or any of the yeah. swords. Or another pair of boots. Or another mine. No, that's not any equipment. Okay. Yep. I just. We're <laughs> done, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mask of memory. I, I, you're in Boros. It gives you card draw on Boros. I'd run it for sure here. Do you run it like pseudo partner with infiltration lens? Um, Is that the one I'm thinking of? Yeah. Uh, one to cast, one to equip. When attached, when an equipped creature becomes blocked by a creature, you may draw two cards. Um, I guess it depends on how often people are blocking. If, if you find that's a thing True. that happens, then maybe. Um, I think there's probably enough ways to make Akiri unblockable. True. And you're probably swinging at people that can't block two. I, I don't know if it's going to. Okay. It's going to go off, off enough to make That makes sense. Uh, Mindstone, Soul Ring, both great mana rocks. Yep. Um, Swiftfoot Boots gets around the can't target your own stuff thing or Voidant Greaves because there's no Greaves in here. Nope. Shroud's that, a no-no in this That guy. makes sense when you're attaching equipment. Sort of X and Y. So we have Body and Mind. That's the blue-green one. Uh, plus two, plus two, pro blue-green. Uh, deal combat damage, make the wolf, and then they mill 10? Yes. Uh, then we have Sword of Light and Shadow, so that's pro black white plus two plus two, deals combat damage, gain three life, and you may return up to tar- one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. We have the two new ones from yep. Modern Horizons, so Sword of Sinew and Steel, uh, pro black and red plus two plus two, and then deals combat damage to a player, disrupt to one target planeswalker and up to one target artifact. Uh, truth and Justice, so pro blue, white, and plus two, plus two, and then whenever it deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature you control, then proliferate. Uh, War and Peace, pro red and white, uh, combat damage to a player, deals damage equal to the number of cards in his or her hand, and you gain a life for each card in your hand. And then, so those are all the X and Ys. Yep. So we're missing the black green one. Yep. And we're missing, because that's four, right? That's one. one, two, three, four, five. So, so we're missing two, missing two missing. The blue, red, and the black, green one. Yep. So, I mean, they're all good. There's like there's almost no situation where the, any of the sword cycle is bad in a deck. Yeah. Um, and maybe he replaced those with the other two just to try the two new ones out, too. I, I very, would surprise very me at well all. could be. Um, I mean, you could definitely run the other two, and they would do good things. And I, I think... They're easy recommends in any deck. That's why I kind of wasn't even, I didn't, I didn't even dig too de- deeply in that. I'm like, you know what? You can run seven. If you're only running five, that's fine too. They're all good. I don't like the red, white one. Which one is that? The, uh, uh, War and Peace. Why is that? Well, I, it's probably good in the fact that the opponent's going to get dealt a bunch of damage if they're mm-hmm. drawing cards, but I don't think you're going to get enough off of the you gain in life. Yeah. But it's still, it's a finisher. I get it. You run them. But I also think I would probably run, like, like, like I said, one of the foils in the spot. I think probably yeah. win you games more than the sword does. Mm-hmm. Uh, sword of the Animist. You're in Boros and it ramps. That's good. Yep. Talisman of Conviction is also a, another way to ramp. Yep, another mana rock. And Trailblazer Boots gets you through unblockable. Um, a quick creature has non-basic land walk, which is going to be... Every... 99% of the time it's going to work. Yep. So it's relatively, you know, two and two. That's pretty cheap to equip too once it's down. Um, actually, I think Trailblazer Boots are probably underplayed a little bit. Uh, Whisper Silk Cloak is great, but it grants Shroud, and you Grand don't want Shroud. Shroud in this deck. So uh, there's no Ember Cleave here, and you do have 16 creatures. Um, it costs one less to cast for each attacking creature you control, um, and when it enters the battlefield, attach it to target creature you control. Creature gets double strike and trample. If you really <laughs> want to have Fire Shrieker in the deck, I would probably run that over Fire Shrieker. It's going to probably cost. It's going to cost. Roughly, this is, you're attacking with a Kiri and something else. You know, maybe you're attacking with two or three things even. But it's a surprise, which is a big deal, I think, sometimes. And the trample isn't nothing either. I don't know. I don't I don't like it. The fact that it's a combat, to get the full benefit, it's a combat trick. Yep. And early game, I don't think you're attacking with more than a Kiri and Bruce. So you're yep. going to cast this for four? Yeah. Two and two red? It gets equipped for free, which is fine. But if something dies, I th- it's probably worth trying. Yeah. I'll say that. It's okay. probably worth trying. I don't think you're going to be... Uh, I don't think it's going to work out as well as something like in a Valduke deck or I something. I think it works much better in other decks yeah. than it does in this one. I mean, at that point, I'd rather just run a cheaper equipment or like 
go kind of offshoot and play like Dictator Heliod or something. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts here, Max? I think this is a really cool Boros deck. I've seen one or two of these partners in the last few years in our shop, but they come and go quickly. Yep. Um, I think this is this is extremely tuned. Like this is one it of those is. decks that I open it up going, okay, this is there's there's a lot going on here, and I can see the different paths to victory. That's what I really like about this deck. I think that it's a deck, um, and I have built these kind of decks before, where you need 110, you you want 110 slots. Th- there's a bunch of red draw spell things, whether it's like a cathartic reunion or a the, the new one from the commander type that has flashback, where when you flash it back, you cast those spells that has impulse draw, and I've yep. I've, I've I know what you're talking about. I don't know. I've forgotten the name. the name, but like, or or act on impulse, or like there's some fairly efficiently costed red impulse draw spells that would be good in this deck. And I don't know how you find room for them without dropping six pieces of equipment and four creatures. Like, I don't know. There's no right. way to balance that and, in this deck. And the issue with those cards in this type of deck, though, are there's, there is a little bit of recursion in this deck, but do you really want to be rummaging right. away your, your sword of X and Y and your. Collo- your your hammer and is on yep. to, to draw out, oops, I just drew two lands. And that's the problem that we oftentimes with these decks that go really heavy into a thing, and in this case it's going heavy into equipment, is it soaks up slots in your deck, and sometimes you can offset that. I'll use my Jeru deck, for example, by running 16 Planeswalkers. I'm That's you know a, a lot of slots that decks usually don't have to devote to Planeswalkers. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm not running a bunch of creatures. I'm down to like three creatures or two creatures in that deck. So I've exchanged creatures for Planeswalkers and kept the rest of the deck kind of balanced. Yeah. In this case, you're trying to run 16 creatures in addition to 24 artifacts or something. Something has to give, and I, I think he's chosen to sacrifice the card draw Boros has, as limited as it is, to still try to keep the creature count and the equipment count high and hope to win before it matters. Yeah. And I, and that makes sense because, like I said, something has to give. Yep. My Vela deck, I've had to sacrifice counter magic because I don't have slots for all the <laughs> artifacts and counter spells. That's okay. Well, 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 I think every deck you build to a degree that's particularly trying to do something really specific, you have to give something up. So I get why he's given it up here. Yeah. Um, I, too, like this deck. I like seeing people do something with Boros. Um, I respect the two Boros commanders that people like to kind of crap on and you're doing you're doubling down and going Boros, Boros partners. That's fun. Um, I think a few of the changes we suggested will make a big deal. I think some of the damage doublers yeah. that stack with double strike are really useful. I think they're pretty minor tweaks, and I think it'll make this deck that's already probably pretty solid a little bit better. I 100% agree. Well, thank you very much, Charles, for sharing this deck with us. I hope you enjoy your play, Matt. And thanks a lot for supporting the show. It's a big deal, and it means a lot, so thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yep, and because I remembered. Okay. Happy birthday, because his birthday is come is this coming weekend, so a couple days after this show oh, airs. Oh, cool. So happy birthday from happy us. Happy birthday, Charles. Yeah, very much so. That is going to wrap this show up. Our podcast theme is Retro Future Dirty by Kevin McLeod, licensed via Creative Commons. Our show is edited by Ken Peddle. You can find him on Twitter at LOAD3R. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. You can find Max at CMDR Central underscore Max. And you can find Chris at WiseSquishy1. We'll be back on Monday with a new show. Until then, I'm Dana. And I'm Max. Mm-hmm.